Hi, I'm Cece, and once again I am here in my cosy corner, but today I am joined by Joe Hills of the Hermitcraft server. Howdy, Cece. Joe Hills here. Recording as I always do in your cosy corner. I love this delightful lamp. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> this is a good lamp, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love the perfectly circular amount of light it emits. Oh, absolutely. I originally tried to animate it, but that was that was past my knowledge. <laughs> so it just radiates, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's how we learn about a lot of things, you know? One radiation at a time. <laughs> Motto to live by. So, mm -hmm. before we get into any questions, I have... Well, actually, I guess it is a question. So, you see the paintings behind us. I have the little cats, and then you have... Oh, my cat has arrived, speaking of cats. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> my real one. Yeah, so I have a painting of a cat, and then you have, like, a little card back there. Mm -hmm. I have a couple options. I was wondering which one you would prefer to go with. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've got either the TCG card that I drew for you, or uh -huh. we have bird. <laughs> so... The skin wasn't intended to be a bird. Was it not? <laughs> no, it's supposed to be a puppet. Oh, it's almost like a why... Muppet version of you or something. So, so the uh, that's why if you look at the skin in 3D, the top of the torso has the bottom of a puppet's mouth. It's got like a black area and a tongue. And so oh. when I nod my head up and down in other people's videos, they can see my mouth moving. That makes so much more sense. Yeah, I, I decided uh, I wanted to do something a little bit more visual uh, and kind of cartoonish this season. And I've always appreciated puppetry. I had some fun making some silly masks of the other hermits at the beginning of the Vault Hunter series. And I got thinking, like, eh, maybe I'll try something different with this skin here. I've been arguing with Jem for months now <laughs> that her, because her skin doesn't have a mouth on the front of it. And so I've Does said, like, no, there's no there's no mouth on the front of Jem's skin. And I've always said, so like the the top of your torso is where the bottom of your mouth is, right? Like if you open it up, it'll look like Kermit the Frog or something. And she's like, no, that's silly. <laughs> and uh, so I was like, you know what? I can I can take all of these things. I can take proving Jem wrong that this is a brilliant idea. I can take the fact that I've always loved like the Jim Henson television workshop, all that stuff. Um, and the fact that like, I wanted to be a little bit more animated on Hermitcraft this year. Uh, mash them all together and see what I get. And uh, what I got was apparently a bird. <laughs> I, 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 it makes I, now that you've mentioned it's like a puppet, it, I can completely see it. But uh, I, I just I was wondering why, like, because I, I, I watched uh, like Mumbo's video first. And you never really mm -hmm. interact with Mumbo, so all, all I saw was just like a blue bird-like creature <laughs> across the lava pit. <laughs> it was very strange. But well, that's fair. Yeah, the yeah. puppet does make sense. So, so I if, guess that if you want to redraw some... that real quick and slap that in there, you know, oh, I've yeah. got time. Uh, or yeah, or yeah, we can go just, back to the other one. I think we'll just go back to the other one. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay, so how about we get into like just the start of your YouTube journey and like what was it that started you like making videos? Great question. Um I've I've always been somebody who likes making things and sharing them with other people. Even before YouTube, I was uh making web comics and mm. uh, self-publishing stuff. And what got me really to make the jump to YouTube with my comedy work was kind of two things at the same time. First, I wanted to practice being funny in front of an audience more. Mm. And so I looked at the local comedy club, Zanies, uh, and this was like 12 years ago, and they had a getting started in a comedy night where they're like, we'll give you two minutes on stage. All you need to do is bring four friends who each buy two drink tickets and an entree. And Ooh, you've just vanished. now I'm, Why have you vanished? yeah, I've vanished because I was like, I can't, I have plenty of friends, but none of us <laughs> can afford two drink tickets and an entree. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, I was just like, well, that's a terrible way for me to practice being funny. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I need to, I need to find another way to practice being funny. And so that was about when Hannah Hart launched my drunk kitchen. Uh, she mm. goes by Harto on YouTube. Uh, yes. And I was watching it 
with my ex-wife and my sister-in-law and I'm like, look at this. This is brilliant. If I made a cooking show, this is the cooking show I would want to make. And they're just like, well, then why don't you make that? And I was like, well, because Hannah Hart's already making it. I don't need to make this. Yeah. But I could make something. And I got to figure out what that is. I had been playing Minecraft already. Uh, a lot of my friends played Minecraft. I was part of an online community uh, connected to the Shaft podcast already. And so I knew guys who were making podcasts about Minecraft, and they were interviewing YouTubers about it and stuff. And I thought, okay, well, what if I try to make something good enough to be on their podcast? Because mm -hmm. if I did, then that would give me a boost. And if I didn't, they could at least tell me why I didn't deserve to be on their podcast. Yeah. You know, like, because these are these were guys who I had known for years. I'd been playing Team Fortress 2 with them. Like, we knew each other. We, we would hang out a few times a year at conventions, um, that sort of thing. I've been to one of their houses, maybe one, maybe more. But um, it's kind of one of those things where I was like, OK, this is a good way for me to practice being funny, where if I'm successful, I have a way for it to ramp up. If I'm not successful, I have a way to learn from it. And I'm going to go see what happens. So I started making super hostile videos and uploading them to YouTube. And from day one, I was getting about 190 views on each video because I had already spent years building a following in web comics. And I was already right. plugged into another Minecraft community. And, uh, you know, all of these um, things kind of snowball, you know? So I started off, you know, the comic I was making, we got about 2,000 views every time we put out an update, which is which was once a week. So out of those 2,000 views, like slightly less than 10% of people came over to watch my Minecraft videos. And with webcomics, I was kind of on the trailing edge of the, the wave of webcomics, but with this Minecraft YouTube thing, I was much closer to the leading yeah. edge. And so kind of getting that strong start, you know, okay, every time I upload a video, it usually hits about 195, 200 views or so, and then it kind of trails off. Yep. It's like, okay, well, I'll just keep making those and uh, see what happens. Eventually, you know, my show was good enough that I got to go on the Shaft podcast, and that helped some. Um, it helped that the guy who was making the super hostile maps of Etches uh, liked what I was doing and started mentioning it when he would post a new map, you know, Oh, Hey, Joe Hills is going to play this, that sort of thing. You know, yeah. That helped. Um, but you know, a lot of it though, was the fact that I had done the groundwork of networking. Yes. I had been going to conventions for years, hanging out with a lot of the people who were in that first 195, like, and even now with my Patreon, I would say I've met dozens of the people who support me on Patreon in real life at least once many yeah. of them many times because i go out of my way to prioritize going to conventions and spending time playing games with people and letting them know that i am a real person you know uh, when i am acting in comedic ways in uh hermitcraft or things like that that's me trying to be funny and also sometimes trying to be more patient than I am normally, not right. necessarily me putting on an entirely like fake persona. It's like an and, amplified and the, one. Yeah. Well, and I want to talk about the patience thing too, because that was a decision I made day one. Like when I started on YouTube, I started looking at like people in these channels will a lot of times ham up something yes. about themselves. And with like Hannah Hart doing the my drunk kitchen thing, she was drinking a lot. And I was like, if I did a, sh if I do a show like that, like habits that you start to form when you're doing a show like that can become life habits. Yes. And I'm like, I don't want to do a show about drinking because no. I will end up drinking too much. And also I cannot afford it. <laughs> no. I don't want to do, I don't want to do a show where I'm a rage gamer, where it's like, I knew I was going to play these super hostile maps because I really liked them. Yes. But I was like, if I start playing these maps and, and my gimmick is every time I die, I throw things or I'm angry, I am not a disciplined, trained actor. I yeah. can't act that way for an hour or two a day without it 
impacting how I approach other things. So I said, okay, I'm going to be facing all these incredible challenges in these maps. I'm going to try to be extra patient, extra chill about mm -hmm. stuff. Like I'm still going to have like, those maps have a lot of kind of jump scare type things, not necessarily jump scares, but there are traps, there are bad things that can happen. And like, there's authentic, like, ah, you know, freaking out reactions. But, um, you know, it wasn't going to be one of those things where I was going to act extra angry. I was going to try to be extra, like, this is okay. We're going to make it work. Let's figure it out. You know, that sort of thing. And I feel like that that has helped me in other aspects of my life to act more chill than I am, even when I'm kind of freaking out. Yeah, you um, just like change yourself almost. Yeah, well, and, you know, like I said, if I was a real actor, if I was a mm. professional actor who took on parts and played them for a living, I'd probably be able to compartmentalize that better. But that's not my background, you yeah. know? It's uh, it's 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 a it's a hard thing to to do is like putting on a persona without just becoming the persona, I guess. Because mm -hmm. like, I've I've noticed like for my videos, I try and be more family friendly, like less swears and stuff. And that's mm -hmm. I've, I've start I've started being like that outside of videos more as well. So I'm just mm -hmm. imagining what it'd be like if you were like a full on rage gamer. Like <laughs> it just yeah. can't be healthy for you. Well, it's just, it's the sort of thing, too, where it's like, if that's going to be how people view me, yeah, you know, like, I don't want people to be scared of approaching me at conventions because they think I'm going to yell if somebody, like, drops <laughs> yeah. a pen. Hey, can you sign this? Oh, no, I dropped the Sharpie. He's going to flip out. You know, that's yeah, not that's... cool. No. Yeah. Or I don't want them to be sad if they intentionally drop the Sharpie and I didn't yell. Yeah, like, oh, man, I intentionally, like, dropped this thing on his shoe and he was cool about it. I wanted him to do the whole thing where he flips out. Like, ugh, it's not for me, you know? No, I, I, I can definitely see that. It's it's not really a side of the content sphere that I ever really thought about of, like, your persona as being something people expect from you. But, like... Oh, yeah. I can t think of so many examples where, like, YouTubers are nothing like who they are on screen, and, like, fans being almost weirded out by that, like, in conventions and stuff. So I guess it's good, a good to, like, get out, get that out of the way in the first place and be a persona you want to be. Exactly. And, and there's also a difference. People will say, like, oh, I'm coming to your stream for the first time. Yeah. And you're a lot less energetic. And it's like, well, there's a reason for that. When I record, I need to go back and listen to all that footage. And I want to be talking as fast as possible yeah. so that it takes me less time to do it. I <laughs> Every time I'm sitting there editing, I'm like, oh, I should be talking faster. I should be talking faster. Why am I talking so slow here? Dang it, dang it, dang it. You know, um, so it's to help me not be mad at myself. But also, I can't maintain that level of energy for like a two hour, three hour stream. Gotcha. The streams are more chill and just hanging out and passing time with people, you know? And so when I press record and I go from like, okay, guys, we're going to uh, we're going to try and do a few takes here. Let's let's see how this goes. You know, take one action. And I'm like, here we are back at this tower. I might think it's tall enough. You might not think it's tall enough, but we can agree to disagree. Let's meet in the middle of this tower, which is where we're going to put a window. Windows look great in the middle of things, except, uh, you know, computers. From an operating standpoint, I recommend Unix or something Unix derivative of. You know, like, I'll just ramble, like, yeah. really fast. I'm not even thinking about what I'm saying half no, the time. It's... I'm just looking at things and going, you know? Stream of conscience. <laughs> Conscious. Yeah. yeah. But people, people don't want that when they're meeting you in person either like they don't want you commenting on like everything they're wearing and making jokes about it <laughs> that'd be exhausting <laughs> it, well it would be exhausting but it, it's also like harder to keep up with i bet yeah it, it you know people are already kind of like sometimes the first time they meet they get to meet people whose work they enjoy it can be kind of a bewildering experience so yeah I'm not going to inconvenience you by talking extra fast. <laughs> You're already <laughs> potentially bewildered or out of your element here. Um, you know, so I'm just I'm just going to talk my normal speed, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, yeah, people expect, though, sometimes that level of energy, if they haven't seen your streams, you know, but they've only seen the videos, they might expect that level of energy in person. Whereas, like, when I go to a convention, I'm just like, Oh, this is great. I'm just here to play games and talk to people. Like like I'm chilling. 
you know yeah. i'm i'm relaxing it's it's nice but it's it's not go 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 so uh you mentioned all your streams and stuff like that and i earlier i was actually watching one of your streams you were doing a uh, an art stream with cleo mm-hmm. and i was wondering like how long have you been doing them like together like oh I like well I've seen them for i was gonna say i I started doing art streams by myself in 2008. Nothing Actually, eight. before yeah, before I started doing the Minecraft videos, I was already streaming, drawing comics, uh, several days a week, and so yeah, that I'm, I'm one of the few people who's been streaming longer than they've been YouTubing. Yeah, that's not uh, common. <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't get started on YouTube until about three years later, oh, but okay. yeah, uh, that was one of those things where. Because I would go to all these conventions and hang out with other web cart comic artists or web cartoonists and uh, also other like viewers or readers or fans or whatever, you know, basically it was a way for people who I would only get to see like three or four times a year at events to pop in and hang out, you know, because I was broke. I was paying off a bunch of student loans and stuff. And so it's like, hey, every night, instead of being sad that I can't afford to go out hanging out at bars with my friends, I'm just going to stream myself drawing. And then if people want to pop in and chat, they can. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things where maybe I'd have like one to six viewers a night for that yeah. for that three years. Um, and I ended up kind of stopping those streams when I started making YouTube videos because that kind of ate the same time. Yeah, you went but, out of time um, doing it, yeah. Yeah, and it... But it was just one of those things where, um, yeah, so I'm actually used to doing drawing streams. I've been doing those for 15 years now. But I started doing the crafts with Cleo back uh, right before season eight started. We decided to kind of try to do craft streams together where we were building uh, paper craft models of Castle Hohenzollern. Yes. We both bought different paper craft kits for the same castle. So people could watch us each taking different approaches to building the same castle, which ended up pretty neatly paralleling how we ended up building the castle that season. Where yes. We're both trying to make the same thing, but we're not coming at it the same way. Uh, that was a lot of fun working with Cleo on that. Um, but yeah, even after we finished the paper craft models, Cleo's like, well, I want to use this time to work on my journal. And I was like, oh, I've always got weird random art projects I want to do. Um, I was designing a logo for my uh, museum I'm going to be building in Hermitcraft Season 10. Yes. Um, and uh, I've got some other stuff. I've I've ordered some, I almost want to say supplies, but I, I don't know if something that, like, costs, like, $160 for you to paint on is a supply or if that, at that point it's a canvas. Um, yeah, that's, 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 how big is that? Yeah, like. It's uh, it's pretty big. I, I basically ordered a uh, playfield blank, which is a uh, pinball machine playfield where they haven't cut all the holes. They've only cut the lower third where the flippers and the oh. ball guides go. And so I'm going to be uh, like uh, working on taking that and making an actual physical model of the deep field pinball machine that I built in season nine in Minecraft. Um, I'm still getting that playfield cut though has taken longer than I expected. We've had a lot of storms and stuff in the southeast here, and yeah. stuff's gotten slowed down. So yeah, in the in the future though, I'm hap uh, I'm hoping to do some actual like physical playfield painting, construction, design work uh, during those craft streams. So should be a lot that's of really, fun. That's really cool, actually, like making mm -hmm. custom pinball almost. Yeah, uh, no, that's it's not almost. That's uh, I guess that it's just it is. Yeah, it's not even almost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is this is a prototype step toward building a working machine. You know, I, I keep mentioning how much I love going to conventions. Yes. One thing I always appreciate is when people bring things to those events that they can share with others. You yeah. know, um, like at PAX, being able to interview Beef in front of the audience was a great thing because... I've loved going to PAX for years, but I've only actually gotten to go on stage twice. But every time I do, I really feel like I'm giving back to the convention and saying thank you to the organizers and to the community, you know, because I want to help create the experiences for others that were created for me by others, you know? Yes. And uh, 
bring in a if I can get this prototype working, which is not going to be fast. No. It's not, it's not going to be soon. The ball will go 95 miles an hour off the flipper. The ball will move fast once it's working. But um, in the long term, what I'd love to do is actually get a prototype machine that's fully functional that I can bring with me to conventions so people could come up to my booth and play the machine and hang out and talk to me and get something signed or, you know, that sort of thing. That would be so cool. Yeah. yeah. Having a pinball machine at your, uh, <laughs> at your booth. Yeah. And... And a pinball machine that was featured in Hermitcraft Season 9. You know, see? Yes, it's not so just it's not, not just me going out and buying Jaws and being like, yeah. I don't know, Steven Spielberg made a movie. I brought <laughs> the machine here so I can play it when you guys aren't in line. Yeah, this it's is like, my uh, downtime machine. <laughs> yeah, I see, a lot of, I, I, I see a lot of streamers on their phones, and I just don't want to be that guy, so I brought a pinball machine. <laughs> you guys aren't here. I'm just going to go over there. I, I feel like that's more approachable. But... <laughs> I mean, the thing is, though, the fun thing about this is you could actually, if if I can get this thing up and running, ideally, it wouldn't just be like, you can come to the booth and play it. But hey, if there's not a huge line, you can play it against me. Yeah. You know, Pin pinball is designed versus. to be, you, you can have up to four players in a pinball game, you know. So it'd be, uh, it's always really fun for people to get to play games with people at conventions. And yeah. the TCG is fantastic, but it does take... A significant amount of time, and it's one-on-one. Yeah. -on -one. You know, I played a lot of TCG at uh, PAX Unplugged, and it was it was great. But, like, with the pinball machine, I could be, like, playing against three people simultaneously in maybe a third of the time total. You know what I mean? So it's, like, nine times the throughput of be, yeah. people getting to hang out and do stuff. It's, uh, it's PAX Unplugged. That's the one where you went with Beef and did the, the panel, right? Correct. And yes. I saw some of the uh, the post. So I heard uh, a story that you threw a coin in the air and damaged like your cards or something. Oh yeah, the um, <laughs> the uh, TCG coin that came with the game. Yes, is so heavy that I tried flipping it in the air to determine like uh you know whether an effect would go into play or not, and it uh it dented one of the cards. It wasn't like. A super rare card. It was like one of the you know okay, okay. <laughs> common item cards. But yeah, it was one of those things where I was like, oh, I should be more careful about that. Like that's <laughs> yeah. like, that's like uh, the one thing I heard about Pax Unplugged is that you just <laughs> damaged your cards. Well, and once again, though, this was me in the course of normal gameplay flipping a coin. This yeah. was not me, rage gamer. I can't Hurling believe I coin. lost. Let me hurl the coin at the table. <laughs> like, like it went up and it came down. And uh, yeah, I, whew, those those things are okay. So I guess that can get us onto the topic of like the trading card game because sure. you were one of the judges or referee things for the Hermit uh, TCG on the server. Yeah. And do you have like lots of experience with trading cards or is Hermitcraft like the first one? I've played trading card games inside of video games before. Right. Like there was a Pokemon trading card game for the Game Boy. There was a trading card game in Final Fantasy VIII that I particularly enjoyed, but trading card games in the physical world have never been accessible to me cuz No. They cost money. Yeah. And <laughs> they're so expensive. Yeah, I would not have purchased as many TCG cards as I did if I was not given kind of a hermit discount. Um mm. because yeah, so this is the first trading card game I've ever actually bought um cards for. But I did actually do um all sorts of other game design projects kind of in the past. Um, I actually had a Kickstarter to publish a tabletop role-playing game called Pitfalls and Penguins. It was a 260-page open gaming licensed uh, book that I worked with a few other people on. And that was another live streaming experience where I ended up live streaming myself in Adobe InDesign working on that so all the Kickstarter backers could see like, look guys, I know it's not shipped yet, but it's coming. It's, like, it exists. It, it, <laughs> yeah, because we had the book 90% finished when we started the Kickstarter and we were going to conventions and people could like flip through the book and see like, okay, this is 
the binding. This is like two. Uh, this is most of the pages. There's some blank pages in there. There's some missing images. You know that sort of thing. But you can look at it and go, okay, this is this is nearly done, right? Mm-hmm. Um, this is a real thing. This isn't like, hey, we're in the brainstorming phases. We need some money. This is we're gonna be ready to ship this in the next six months or so. Yeah. We just can't print it if we don't have money to print it, you know? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And... That's that's always the hurdle when it comes to that stuff, with getting just them out. Yeah. And we had spent years arguing about the rules and trying to figure out what is and isn't fun, what affects the pace. We also used to live stream those game design sessions. We had mm. Uh, we, we would just set up a webcam and be like, okay, let's go through the spell list and talk about which of these spells aren't funny enough. You know, how do you make something that lets people create mayhem? So what kind of game way... was it? Like a... Is this it, a tabletop okay. RPG? Yes. So uh, if you're familiar with Dungeons & Dragons 3rd yes. Edition, um, <laughs> there was something called the Open Gaming License where people could take the core rules of D&D 3rd Edition and fork them and make their own games that were like compatible or based on it oh okay and we were working on this for a while and we weren't really sure if it had a place we were just like it'd be cool to make a a version of dungeons and dragons that encourages people to kind of improvise comedy together while they go on adventures right and we weren't sure if if it if it was going to have a market and then wizards of the coast released dungeons and dragons fourth edition which was really, really regimented and grid-based, and it had a lot more constraints yeah. than former D&D systems. And we were like, ooh, there's a lot of backlash against these constraints. And yeah. our game is basically D&D unconstrained. It's yeah. D&D unleashed. It's more mayhem, more goofiness. It's It's designed to tell the funniest story you can while still having, like, coherent workable rules which is yeah. a real challenge because you you want everything turned up to 11 but that means everything has to be um compatible with the 11 of everything else yeah. so everything has to be equally 11 <laughs> yeah yeah and so i had a lot of experience working on rules for gaming systems uh you know before working on the this trading card game uh, even though I hadn't worked on a trading card game in particular in the past. Right, because I've been playing some D&D recently, and we're doing a bit of a mix of, like, grid and uh, roleplay. I definitely enjoy the roleplay aspect more. And it's... So did you also have, like, a dungeon master, or is it just, like, a... Like, yeah, you just... would still have a dungeon master, like, t- you know, leading the story and, right. you know, arbitrating things. But the idea was to have a setting that was intrinsically more comical than the setting of Faerun. Inspired silliness. Yeah, and, um, you know, the character classes and species were designed to be kind of more goofy. Like, one of the playable species was Penguin. Uh, One of the playable species was Rabbit. Now, the thing is, this is not like Bugs Bunny, Roger Rabbit, Anthropomorphic Rabbit. This is, you are the size of a loaf of bread. (laughs) Oh. You know, you probably <laughs> you probably want to be a spellcaster at that point because you're not going to carry a sword. You, you know what I mean? Um, to scale you know. rabbits. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's the thing is, so there's a lot of scaling, scaling related humor in the game where it's, uh, you know, because like D&D has a bunch of rules for like play for, for like how creatures of different sizes interact. But yes. it's normally all players are basically the same size, but then monsters can be different sizes. It's like, ah, no, nah, we'll let our players be different sizes too. Why not? You know? Um, and then we would spend, you know, hours arguing the edge cases that that created and try yeah. to figure out, well, what's the funniest way we could change these rules to make, th- how could we make this more fun for players to be different sizes like this or, or whatever? Um, and um, a lot of the abilities we rewrote, the entire magic system to add as many spells that created opportunities for people to be uh, funny as possible and creatively. So like we had a lot of spells that changed things about physics, like <laughs> things, you know, for example, things that adjust the amount of friction on a surface. Oh, Lord. <laughs> making everything icy. <laughs> just yeah. Around. 
<laughs> yeah, and, and so it's like you know, like that that would that would be like an example of one spell, or or like there might be another spell that um. Oh, like we had um a cam we we had a, a player class called the cameraman, and um they had uh, a bunch of abilities. They were kind of like the bard, except instead of singing at somebody, they would point their camera at them and there'd be watching. special effects. <laughs> and like there there was a, a an effect called um the camera adds ten pounds. And if somebody's <laughs> standing on an unstable structure, the structure would collapse. You know, like <laughs> stuff like that. It's like you know. Looney Tunes logical. <laughs> just... Yeah, yeah, it's very, it's very cartoonish logic. Uh, but y you want it to make the the players feel like they can affect the environment around them in fun ways and impactful ways. You know, making sure that every game design choice feels fun and impactful is is kind of one of the things that guides us. You know. So is that a philosophy you also like bring over to your Minecraft as well? Like just trying to make things like fun and but accessible and like it's interesting. Uh, it well, so when I'm trying to make my Minecraft stuff, it's it's a little bit different because that's a cinematic experience right. for viewers rather than uh, a situation where they're in control. I, yeah. Is this actually the opposite? I guess know? yeah, it would be the exact inverse of that yeah so in in one case it's like okay we're gonna put you in control of certain aspects of a chaotic environment <laughs> and in the other one we're gonna say you can choose to buckle up because this is about to get chaotic yeah. but that's the only choice you Your get to only make. choice is to buckle up or hide <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like you either want to be secure or you want to be gone this yeah. is what we're doing and it is happening now there's um, no control <laughs> yeah and uh i, I really feel like uh, the big thing i would say that that really shapes my minecraft stuff is that I try to make things where I'm trying to learn something and I'm trying to enjoy myself. Yes. And I know from experience that I won't always succeed at both of those things, but hopefully I'll succeed at at least one of them in any yeah. given case, you know, and, you and so I won't well. say again, you can always like learn from it if it doesn't fully succeed in the way you initially intended. Oh, yeah, yeah. Things can be educational on all sorts of axes. Yeah, failure is uh, educational. <laughs> yeah. and what not and to so do. It, Yeah, it, it's one of those things like where if I'm pushing myself experimentally enough, it's going to be pretty hard to learn nothing. Yes. Um, You know, then I say that earlier today before Cleo and I had our uh, stream, I like replaced like every piece of audio equipment basically between me and the computer for that call, because I've been trying to experiment with some new technology and we had had trouble last week. So I'm like, that's fine. I'm going to use this entirely new setup. And Cleo's just like, it sounds literally exactly the same. <laughs> and I'm like, it should sound broken in a different way. At yeah. least like <laughs> I, I, I can't learn something if it still sounds exactly the I same. I should have failed that's... differently. <laughs> yeah. Why isn't it failing differently? Uh, so we'll, we'll find out in week three of Joe makes Cleo put up with him testing things. Um, but yeah, it's kind of one of those things where I just, uh, yeah, I try to go in and I try to make stuff that I think is interesting and that I want to learn from. And I'm not chasing the algorithm. No. And that works to my advantage in a lot of ways. One, I don't get burnt out from chasing the algorithm. Yeah. Two, um, I don't have to feel bad if people are like, hey, how come numbers about your channel are lower than other people's numbers or whatever? And it's just like, you know, somebody will be like, oh, you should be playing Pal World. People who are streaming Pal World get 20,000 views on Twitch or whatever. And I'm like, that's fine for them, but yeah. <laughs> I'm doing what I want to do already. And I'm able to get by as a self-employed independent performance artist and entertainer. I mean, that yes. seems yeah. pretty okay. You know, like I, if I was chasing the algorithm and my numbers look like they do now, I would probably feel bad, but yeah, like... I'm doing what I want to do and I'm feeling pretty great. You know, 
Uh, it's it's much more important to just do something you like and build an audience who are interested in that rather than pretending to be something else, I guess. Mm-hmm. And because uh, uh, earlier in the stream, like the bit that I didn't get to catch all of it, but the bit I did catch was you doing a presentation, or like a practice of a presentation for like a new building area on the server. Mm-hmm. And it was really interesting to see like the sort of thought process that goes into like the the the, the projects and how like it would interact with other people's content and all of that. And also, is that just like how the hermit meetings are, like just presentations? It's kind of a joke. Um, so B Dubs never got to do presentations at his old job. And so right. one time he had an idea and he was like, I'm going to make a PowerPoint about this idea and I'm going to pitch it to the other hermits. Um, you know, because now that I'm a professional, I'm going to act professional at Minecrafting. Yeah. And so he just did one one time and we made jokes about it for months. But then people would start coming in with like pitches like, hey, guys, I want to work on this. And they're like, "Nah, I don't know. I can't visualize it. Come back with a PowerPoint, you know, (laughs) and, uh, you know, so it's kind of one of those things where eventually like that in joke had been repeated so many times. So I was like, you know, before you tell me to come back with a PowerPoint, here it is. And so (laughs) other people started making their own PowerPoints in the same way that we just kind of riff on each other in other things. It's not like, oh, we're super regimented. Everything has to be a PowerPoint. It's just like, uh, a lot of us are actually visual people. And so me showing up with a map and like diagrams is helpful. It doesn't necessarily have to be a PowerPoint. I could just drop in a JPEG of the map yeah. and people could figure it out. But um, if I was just like, hey, I need 1,500 by 1,500 blocks from negative 150, negative 1,700 to blah, blah, blah. These coordinates, people would be like, I have no idea where that is, right? You know? Yeah, that means nothing to me. <laughs> yeah. 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 So so it's, it's just like um, I really only needed one slide, which was the picture of... Yeah, I want to do this. this goes on the map <laughs> but i was like i'm I'm gonna put a few extras in there just in case anyone's curious and to kind of um kind of commit to the bit we, yeah. we actually uh we don't have any formal slogan or anything in hermitcraft no formal motto no. but i've come to realize over the years that you could argue that a strong candidate for that would be anything worth doing is worth overdoing <laughs> yeah that's definitely one um, way of uh, describing Hermitcraft. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, I could show up with one map that says, hey, this is where I want to claim this huge block of land. But you know what? I'll throw in three more slides. Let's do it. I think commit to the bit is definitely like just a good way of describing some of the stuff that hermits do. Because like, there's, there's some insane, like, like a, a standard day on the Hermitcraft server is wild for like most other like players <laughs> it's it's such a it's what makes it so interesting to watch i think mm-hmm. but um how about we actually get into your history with hermitcraft because you're one of the sure. few people who has been in every single season correct or active in every single season i should say uh, i think it's just you and exuma who have have that title now i believe that's correct yes so how did you end up joining hermitcraft so, Hermitcraft was founded about five weeks before I was invited to join. Right. And okay. uh, so, yeah, some people think I'm one of the founding members. I'm not. I was actually the first person invited to join. I'm the original new guy. And oh, I didn't okay. realize that I wasn't the new guy anymore until uh, we were arguing about something in, like, season seven. And I was like, look, Asuma, you guys have been around forever, might want to think this way. But, like, you know, some of us are just, and, and everybody's like, Joe, no, you're, <laughs> you've been here seven years. You're not the new guy anymore. I'm like, I'm not the new guy anymore? And they're like, no, you are not. The, you have been here longer than 85% of the people in this call. And I'm like, I'm, <laughs> what? Like, I was, like, in shock. I was like, I forget what Asuma's wrong about. But I stand by my point. Uh, <laughs> but like, yeah, that was that was a a real wake up call for me, uh, because yeah, it's just time flies. Um, but yeah, the guy who invited me to join the server, Generic B, um, said, "Hey, 
you know, I've got this group together. We're trying to do this, you know, Minecraft survival multiplayer thing, which, okay, I want to be clear to everybody who wasn't there back then. There was really only one functional survival multiplayer server at the time. It was called Mindcrack. Yes. And when Good started doing that series, that was completely revolutionary and new because Minecraft multiplayer was so unreliable. It was awful The idea back of trying then. to do yeah. a video series around it was a nightmare. Uh, even though I had been doing single player videos with occasional multiplayer collabs for a while before this, um, one of the reasons that my skin looked like Steve for so long was because you couldn't depend on the servers connecting and getting your skin download and stuff. And so this way, it wouldn't be obvious if there was like a problem with, oh, okay. uh, like, I would just put a chest plate on. You couldn't see that the shirt was wrong or whatever. Oh, yeah, you know? I didn't actually know that. That was that's an interesting tidbit about your skin. I thought it was you thought it already looked like you, so why not change it? <laughs> well, that that is part of it. Is it did already kind of look like me, but yeah. Also, like I was originally never intending to do multiplayer Minecraft with my video series because nobody did it really at the time. Yeah. Um. So yeah, this guy Generic B is like, yeah, I'm kind of uh, doing what Good did with Minecraft. I got some guys together who are like really good builders. I got some people together that are really good redstoners, but it's missing something. And I'm like, well, I don't really know how to do either of those things. I do survival challenge maps, you know, like, yeah. and, and he's like, well, that's the thing is we kind of need a wild card. We need <laughs> something else. And I'm like, okay. So, you know, I joined the server as kind of a weird wild card. I had no idea how to play in a YouTube SMP series because like I said, only like something like less than two dozen people in the world were doing it at the time. There wasn't yeah. a lot of examples out there and I was explicitly told to like do my own thing. So I was doing my own thing. And, uh, you know, I, I've been told uh, by some people, it's like, wow, Joe, you know, you really keep making videos like it's 2011. <laughs> you know, with kind of a disappointed voice. But, uh, you know, Mumbo, I like the way he puts it. He's like, no one has been more consistently themselves than Joe. And it's like, I was doing my own weird thing back then. I'm doing my own weird thing now. And, you know, so it's it's me expressing myself. If people like it, I'll keep doing it the way I'm doing it. If people don't like it, I guess I'm going to go back to having a day job again and I'll keep doing it the way I'm doing it. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, your way is more important than whatever works. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Like I, I'm not, uh, it's, it's kind of one of those things where I really appreciate being able to focus on this with most of my time, but that was never a requirement for me. Yeah. You know, I didn't join Hermitcraft to go full time on YouTube because nobody did that at the time. Not, I joined thing, Hermitcraft yeah. to, make cool stuff that's still my priority you know yes you definitely make some cool stuff like i don't think anyone's ever made a giant pinball machine before it's certainly a unique uh <laughs> minecraft build it's very cool well thank you and uh i also i think one of my favorite builds you ever did was actually a prank it was the the the, the prank on mumba with the rubik's cube wasn't it like oh yeah that was uh back in season two i believe I think it, it was, was three it was, it was, was it three it was a long time ago i can't remember it's been a while yeah it was a jungle place yeah. i know that much yeah it was a long time ago but yeah that that was fun because uh i i was like you know what i haven't done a lot of builds with uh angles yes you know everything in minecraft is very on the grid so i was like okay i'm gonna do the first two levels on the grid so then i'm committed so when i hate doing the top part I've gone too far. I have to finish it. Yeah. You know, um, it's one of those situations where sometimes writers like to write themselves into a corner and see what they come up with when they're desperate. Yeah. Uh, and boy, I can tell you, I was not good at figuring out exactly where that top layer needed to go, but I did not have a lot of time to figure it out. So I figured <laughs> it out. Um, but yeah, so that's the thing too. Is it's like if I'm gonna if I'm gonna build something funny like that to prank somebody, I also 
it's it's good to when I have time, uh, you know, kind of try to push my own limits of like I'm using this as an excuse to build something in a way I wouldn't normally, you know. You're forcing yourself to commit to the bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You have no choice but to. <laughs> no, it's 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 uh, that's really cool. And uh, I was looking through some of your uh, like your most popular videos just to see what people were resonating with, and the one that is your most popular video is one that requires some context i think because it is okay uh, it's a serious let's, let's get the exact title up it's a few serious words for zombie cleo and then it's about like valyrian skies or something and i'm just so curious to know what that is about it's sure from, uh it's from 12 years ago yeah, 12 yeah years the ago. youtube algorithm loves referring this video to people a few serious <laughs> words for zombie cleo yeah so uh i was at an art museum here in town called the frist up in the projection booth over one of the ballrooms and i heard from the guy who made the super hostile series that like he wanted to try and organize a pvp contest uh, between myself and Zombie Cleo, and then I think it was also Pause and Pause versus Zisto uh, right. in this arena in one of his maps. And I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah, let me run outside real quick and uh, record like a uh, a challenge video to Cleo, you know, demanding she show up and face me in this arena. And so, yeah, I, I just, um, I had set up the audio video stuff in this projection booth for this event I was working later that night ran outside while there was still some light, sat on a bench, got my phone out and recorded that. And then, uh, actually, no, it wasn't even my phone. I think this was, no, this was, I think I took my laptop out there and recorded it on the laptop's webcam. Cause yeah, I don't think <laughs> phone cameras were reliable enough. No, not, yeah. Uh, yeah. Cause yeah. Cause I, I remember upload, I think I uploaded it f like while I was killing time. Cause like I was kind of on my lunch break at this event and, uh, yeah, so I just recorded that real quick, uploaded it, and was like, okay, well, that'll be fun to go face Cleo. I didn't think it was going to be this runaway YouTube algorithm hit that yeah. you know people would still be watching 12 years later. Uh, I just thought it was just... fascinating to see as your most popular video. I think yeah. it, it's always interesting to see like what a YouTuber's most popular video is, because like, some things do just get caught up. Because like, my most popular video is a video of Spider-Man dancing. Mm -hmm. It's like that's got nothing to do with my channel, but that's just the thing that YouTube likes to show people. <laughs> it's so was it? Funny. Did you draw Spider Man dancing? No, no. It was just or... like there was a GIF that went around that was like of Spider Man like dancing, and people say, "Oh, it goes with every song." So I just put it with some songs, and like ah. people just seem to really like that. I think I saw it in a Vsauce video actually. Gotcha. But uh, so you've known. So, like that Cleo video is from twelve years ago. So you've known Cleo for a long time. That's from before she joined Hermitcraft as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I invited Cleo to join Hermitcraft. So you, and, I had a feeling that would be the case. So you and Cleo have been like friends for a long time, doing all sorts and stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, someone else that you met as well is Badger. Your, so you're currently engaged, and you've got some troubles with uh the the. What's the troubles with the marriage thing again? Well, okay. So I don't know if you've heard about the United States, but we don't always have it, the yeah. most efficient immigration system. And mm. uh, yeah, so there, it's not that we have unique troubles. No. It's that it just takes a long time to file a fiancé visa and hear back. Right. So basically uh, we filed for the fiancé visa – um in like late may of last year and we've been waiting uh to hear back in the meantime from the government uh until we do badger cannot enter the united states so if we want to hang out we have to like do stuff like i fly to london or we both fly to toronto and you know you might say joe toronto that's kind of random well it's not in the united states and yeah. Both of us flying to Toronto the last time, that, when we went last time, it was $700 for both of us to converge on Toronto 
like both of our round trip tickets together was seven hundred dollars. Whereas for me to fly to London that week would have been twenty two hundred. Jesus. So we saved fifteen hundred dollars by going to Canada. Um and that is uh ridiculous. Yeah, I gotta say, go to Canada in October because their tourist season ends October first. So Basically, you, you, you'll run into is half the restaurants will have signs that say, like, see you in May, where right. like they just close for the winter or whatever. But the places that are open are excited to have you there. <laughs> and uh, the hotel rates are insanely cheap compared to like a month earlier or two I months imagine, earlier. Yeah, like uh, getting in on the end. Yeah, That's yeah. Really interesting. Yeah, because it's not cold enough. At least when we we got lucky on the weather. That's the thing is you're gambling on the weather in Canada yeah. in October. And, but we got lucky. We had great weather. Um, we could see uh, Niagara Falls. We went to Stratford and saw some Shakespeare. It, it was a great time. But, like, if we had tried to do it in September, it would have been way more pricey. Um, but, yeah, so we're, we're kind of doing the long distance thing while we wait to hear back from the federal government. Um, but yeah, that's not like a trouble. That's just the How system is. operating yeah. is, that, is as functional. Just... <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I'd love to see some positive reforms there, but I don't anticipate uh, seeing much uh, anytime no. it, soon enough to help us. So, how did you meet Badger? Ah, great question. So, uh, Badger actually used to work uh, as part of like suma's community team oh. and so you know i was talking to one of Asuma's streams one day and badger was like oh i should check out this guy's videos you know or streams or whatever I started hanging out in the streams hanging out in the community and uh we didn't really interact directly much at the time um but uh a while later i needed somebody to do uh vocals for a song i was working on that was a parody of old town road which was very briefly the most popular song in the world. Yeah, and, uh, that was a weird time. <laughs> I had to hit while the iron was hot on that. So uh, I had a concept for a parody song about The Good Place, one of my favorite television shows. I love The Good Place. Yeah, uh, so the song is called Good Place Road, and uh, Badger voices Eleanor and um, for one of the verses. And so Badger worked with my sister Quinn on that at the time. I didn't really work with Badger much, but it was just kind of one of those things where it kind of opened the door for future conversations. Right. And yeah. Uh, yeah. And so then, like, after I got divorced, we started talking a little bit, and it kind of start got to be one of those things where it's like, hey, you know, we seem to get along pretty well. Maybe we should start dating. Why don't you fly here and we'll hang out a little bit and see if there's something going on? And uh, it, it seemed to work out pretty well um when we were spending time together so it's just like okay let's uh let's see if this goes anywhere and badger invited me oh you should come up to this uh wedding in ireland uh for a friend of mine who's an acquaintance of yours and i was like yeah that sounds good and uh, so i was getting ready to go visit badger in ireland when the pandemic hit and so it was like okay well canceling this ireland trip but you know how bad can this be i'm sure it'll get resolved in three or four months well how bad this could this be it'll be resolved in like seven or eight months you know and so i didn't plan to be in a long distance relationship where i almost never got to see the person i'm on the phone with all the time but that's kind of what happened and like if i had known up front how long it was going to be before we could resume flights between the continents uh i would have been maybe a little bit hesitant to commit to that but you know I kept thinking, like, ah, it'll just be another month or two. It'll be another three to four months. It, it won't be bad. And uh, it, it was it was really hard um, not getting to see each other. But we were constantly talking to each other on the phone, playing games together, watching shows, uh, keeping each other company, and, uh, you know, through that, like, particularly difficult time for everybody. And uh, so then at that point, it was kind of like, okay, well, as soon as flights resumed, it's like, okay, Badger came and hung out here for like three months and we spent a lot of time together. Badger went back home, came back again. We hung out more. And it's like, okay, I feel like if we had been hanging out all the time during those pandemic years in person, we would have already gotten married. Like, let's yeah. start talking about 
Like, it seems like there's something here. We're also, you know, both in our, like, mid to late 30s. So, you know, it's not one of those things where we don't know what we're looking for in a relationship or with partners and stuff. It's like, okay, we've been dating for a few years now, talking for hours every day. Like, let's uh, let's make this happen. Um, so, yeah, we uh, got engaged a couple Octobers ago. Then it took me way too long to give up on trying to file the immigration paperwork myself um because <laughs> i thought okay i've heard that this immigration paperwork stuff is hard but like probably that's because a lot of people aren't well educated or don't speak english as a first language or aren't familiar with like government bureaucracy and it's like I've, i you know i've i've dealt with this maybe not this but i've dealt with the u.s tax system yeah uh before i've dealt with other parts of government uh i have a university degree i speak english as a first language i'm pretty sure i can figure this out i could not figure this out uh but here's the thing is you might say joe that's that's hubris why would you think you could figure this out because the alternative was paying an attorney five thousand dollars that i didn't <laughs> have and so that's a really good incentive to keep trying at something for six months that's a good motive but, for uh, hubris <laughs> yeah and, and at the end of the day i was just like you know what i've I'm just going to pull five grand out of my retirement fund. I'm going to have to pay a huge tax penalty on it. But, you know, I didn't feel comfortable, like, going to the viewers and saying, hey, guys, you want to do a fundraiser for five grand so that my fiance can apply to live here? That, yeah. especially because, like, I felt like I had already failed by not figuring this out in the, like, I, the, I, it wasn't like I wasn't working on this either. I was working on this all the time, but I just, the more I worked on it, the less certain I was. The more I was right. like, Oh man, there's a lot of conflicting information here. There's a lot of if you file this wrong, you could wait 18 months and then get declined. You don't even know that you filed it wrong for a year and a half, and then you got to start over. Like sounds like a nightmare. It, yeah, it is. And um, so it was one of those things where I was just like, you know what, I I can't. I'm not gonna go ask somebody else to pay for this. Technically, with the retirement fund thing, it's like I did the work to get that money in there. Yep. And yeah, I might pay for it later, but I mean, I I just felt like I couldn't wait any longer to file this. It's like we've been, by the time we filed, it's like we've been engaged for over six months and this could take a year and a half or more. We need to get this going so we can get this, you know, so we can actually get married and live on yeah, the same continent. It's, it's, you know? I mean be nice to actually just have it down on paper just makes life way easier i'd imagine just yeah and a lot yeah, less so, stress <laughs> yeah so we're, we're hoping to hear back from them sometime in the next few months and it's uh a after that though it's, it's it's a different um kind of set of stressors because once badger gets here we've got 90 days to actually get married and oh, so i've got it, a right. bunch yeah i got a bunch of requests out to places where i'm like hey if I needed to get married there in 90 days, or, hey, if I needed you to cater something in less than 90 days, are there particular times that are better or worse for you? You know? And every caterer is like, don't bother us in December. <laughs> like, <laughs> we're busy with holiday parties. Um, but, yeah, so it's... It, when we do get married, it's probably going to be very rushed. But, yeah. luckily, um, you know, I live in Nashville, and I've lived here since 2004. I... I know a bunch of places that we might be able to get, you know, like I went to college here. So the, ch the university has three chapels. Maybe we can get one of them. If we can't get one of them, it's like, well, I know a guy who owns a, a bar. He's got a porch in the back where <laughs> bands play. I know an alleyway. So that, yeah, no, it's literally like, oh <laughs> yeah, we can get married on the stage next to the dumpsters. Uh, <laughs> but you know, that's better than not getting yeah, married so you, i mean i, I want to be married i don't i yeah it's like we have to have a wedding in order to be married so we will have a wedding but this is that it's like i don't have a dream wedding scenario in place i have a <laughs> frantically assemble a wedding um sometimes I, I i use the metaphor like people ask me like well joe it seems like you you um, spend a lot more money than other streamers on like backup equipment or fallback plans or things. Mm. And I'm like, I, I kind of, part of my mentality is I've had so many things go wrong at various points in my life. I need to have enough safety nets, which I expect may individually fail. 
yeah. that as I fall through them, I can grab them and weave together a parachute. Perfect. Like, yeah. <laughs> there's you're, you're there's plan no G one now. <laughs> solution to anything. When once stuff goes sideways, you just got to start grabbing stuff and making things work. And that's, you know, probably not most people's approach to wedding planning. No. But <laughs> it's it's where we are, you know. <laughs> It's definitely an interesting approach, but I like yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Contingency plans and <laughs> backups yeah. and all that stuff. I guess it's kind of associated with uh, weddings. I imagine that you are probably into music. You, you give me the vibe of someone who's like a bit of a music head. <laughs> well, I mean, that's one of those things like I enjoy music and mm. I've written two albums worth of songs but, like, I don't have a lot of time to, like, discover new artists. No. Right? You know, so, like, um, I, I did hear uh, a new song that was just released last week um, by Billy Joel, who... He's still making been, music? He put out his first single, uh, his first new piece of pop music since 1993 last week. Really? And I went out of my way to listen to that. But a lot of times, if somebody's like, oh, hey, this band has a new album, I'm like, oh, cool, I'll get to it when I get to it. And yeah. so I'm not up with the trends. Um, I know that Taylor Swift announced a new album at the Grammys because my daughter asked me to find a New York Times article about it for her. Right. But that's, <laughs> it. that's that's it. I really I could tell you all about Taylor Swift and Billy Joel these days. Quite the combo. It's, yeah. <laughs> so... But, like, what kind of, like, genres and stuff are you, uh, like, into? Um, well, when I'm... It depends on what I'm doing. Mm. Um, so, for certain types of work, I like things that are very lyrically complex and high speed because that keeps the kind of uh, vocal part of my mind occupied. Because, mm. like, I'll start writing my own songs or coming up with story ideas or writing jokes if I'm not listening to something that really um, hits that kind of mental range if that makes yeah. any sense and so yeah. for certain things where I need to shut off that part of my brain I might put on something that I know the lyrics to that's very fast like um, for example Hamilton is mm, that's, uh, that's definitely fast <laughs> it's definitely fast uh but yeah, that that would that would be something. Um, but yeah, it's like you're canceling I, I like... out your frequency or something. Like yeah. yeah, yeah, it's it's just like me keeping that part of my brain busy. Like oh, here's a toy, so the rest of me can work. That's uh, interesting. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like I like um, I like uh, flogging Molly uh, is really good. I've seen them live; they're great. Um, I've seen uh, Jack Black and Weird Al both here Ooh, in Nashville at the Ascend Amphitheater. Yeah, um but yeah, I like I like funny stuff um like them. Um but yeah, I'm not I'm not the best at actually like what some people would consider musicality. You know, I don't write my own melodies or no. compose music for my songs. I usually just write the lyrics and then hand them off to my sister Quinn and I'm like, "Oh, like here's a voice memo for how I imagine the refrain sounds." And Quinn's just like, "Those are None of those are notes. That <laughs> I, okay, I'll I'll try to get back to you. <laughs> they show our sounds. I, here's what I think you're trying to do. Is that right? And I'm like, yes, but more like this artist. And then Quinn would be like, what you did sounded nothing like that artist. I'm like, what? <laughs> no, that was exactly like. And Quinn's like, it's fine. I'll try it again. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I don't. I I I find it's fun to express myself lyrically but yeah um, it's, it's a bit of a challenge to express myself musically no, I, I i don't have an ounce of uh like i can't play any instruments and stuff but i do like the the, the singing part of music but mm -hmm. because of that i feel like i have to do the opposite of you and use like instrumental music to do any work i can't pay attention to the vocals or else i'll just be only paying attention to the vocals so i usually do a it lot of like jazz and stuff when i'm working mm -hmm. Well, it definitely depends on the sort of work I'm doing. That's yeah, true. if I if I've got like other people around and we're having a conversation, I would definitely rather have something instrumental play. Yeah. Like, um, you know, if we're having people over for a Christmas event, 
I'll try and, you know, pull up a playlist of instrumental Christmas songs, you know, that sort of thing. Because it's just yeah. easier for people to talk if there's not lyrics in the background. Is, yes, singing over the top of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so so it, it's not that I always love lyrically complex things, but they're, they're one of my go-tos for, like, getting a lot of work done and focusing on stuff. That's interesting. So you mentioned, like, Flogging Molly. I'm un I'm unfamiliar with them, but it is an interesting name for a band. And like, what is like the 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 weirdest or your favorite band name you've come across? The weirdest. Okay, There's I'm some really strange bad band at names ranking. Out there. Yeah, I'm really <laughs> bad at ranking things. Oh, okay. And so I can I can try to think of a weird one, but I can't promise it's gonna be the weirdest. Uh, I mean. So in terms of funny band names, um, I do like Pig with the Face of a Boy. Um, That's good, they, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they did a complete history of the Soviet Union as told through the eyes of a humble worker, which is a complete history of the Soviet Union as told through the eyes of a humble worker. Oh, it's a very literal set, title. <laughs> but it's set, to, it's set to the Tetris music, where it's like, I am the man who arranges the blocks that descend upon me from up above. <laughs> you know, um, but like it's got it's got great lyrics in it. Like, what's the point of it all when you're building a wall and in front of your eyes it disappears? You know, like, <laughs> um, and, but yeah, pig with the face of a boy is pretty good. I like Garfunkel and Oates. Garfunkel um, and Oates is a good one. Uh, yeah, they're they're hilarious. Uh, I've seen them live too. Um, oh well, of course. Um, everybody knows Buddy Holly and the Crickets. There's a group out of Liverpool that calls themselves the Beatles, but it's like B E A T L E S, kind of a play on Buddy and the Crickets. But like you know, they're a bug, but they got beat. Right. <laughs> but yeah, those are just the three I could think of. I think my favorite band name of all time has to be Chumba Wumba. That's a good one. So how about we jump over to some sillier questions now that we're getting sure. to the end of this. So I know you said you're not very good at ranking. So how about instead of asking your favorite color, I say instead ask which color has the worst personality? Oh, boy. I I don't know. <laughs> which See, color would like, you not I... want to be in a room with? <laughs> yeah, I I really try not to... Uh, anthropomorphize things, you know? Um, so, yeah. Like, if I was going to be in a room that was painted a color, I don't know that I would really care. Okay. You know, this is, this is one of those things, like, when my daughter was first born, she didn't sleep through the night for, like, the first, like, three months. And I was mm. telling all my friends, I was like, I'm glad that we had a kid when we were young because, you know, I've got a lot of energy even though I'm not sleeping. And, you know, you know, it'd be a mistake to wait. You know, I'm glad we're doing this now. Then she didn't sleep through the night for nine months. <laughs> and I'm telling all my kids, uh, not my kids, I'm telling all my friends, like, just don't don't even don't have a kid now. Give it like eight <laughs> or nine years. They'll have those Gattaca babies that are genetically engineered to like sleep through the night and that's what yeah. you want you want the sleep through the night the bio baby. babies <laughs> yeah and and so like the thing is like when you're describing like a room that's like got an unpleasant color in it i'm just like i guess i would just take a nap like i <laughs> like so much stuff doesn't bother me right now this is you know while we're while we're giving you know a little bit of insight to the viewers you know i think it's really important that people not waste their time making idle threats you know, like if you're going to threaten somebody with an action, it should be a plausible, proportional action. If you say like, <laughs> oh, man, I'm going to come over there and throw your car in a lake. Nobody's going to believe you'll do that. It's oddly yeah. specific, but it's not plausible. But like if I'm having an interaction that I don't want to be a part of, I could just say. I'm going to go take a nap right now unless we resolve this because this just isn't worth my time. <laughs> that person knows I am serious. Like, I'm just like, you know what gets rid of a color in a room? I can close my eyes. I can take a nap right here. Next problem. I am done with that color. Like, you know, like I just, 
it, it, like this scenario is preposterous to me because I'm like, I would simply not be awake. I would simply leave. I would not be. I would not engage with the color. I would not engage with this if this was a if this happened. Like I'm just, this I'm, is... just, I'm just applying that like sort of mentality to other like more serious situations. Like, oh, you ran into a bear. I shall sleep and it won't deal with. <laughs> I will face it. <laughs> That's such an interesting answer to the question. I, I I never would have expected it to go there, but I like that. Just, I feel like it's better than just saying green. <laughs> like, yeah, what, I, you know I, what? I, what do you get out of that? I, <laughs> I was gonna say yellow. I think this is some. I think yellow would be rude. <laughs> but, no, I think just uh, sleeping to avoid your least favorite colors. So, what's your favorite color then? Ah. Uh... What color do you have mean, a conversation with? <laughs> I mean, I I try not to also talk to inanimate objects. Okay. Uh, or colors. Uh, but you know, uh, it's it's just one of those things. I gotta say, if you want to be informed every time you're starting to to think out loud, I got some new uh headphones that lower the volume of what you're listening to if you start speaking. Really. Yeah, because it assumes like, oh, you're trying to have a conversation with somebody. Let me turn down. I didn't realize like I like some you know I'd be listening to a podcast and somebody say something and I'd be like I'd like repeat it like oh like this could be a joke or I could do something with that or whatever and then all of a sudden the podcast volume turns down or I hear a song <laughs> lyric and I repeat it and I'm like oh that could be you could do a poem that's like a play on that like I just I didn't realize how much stuff I'm saying out loud. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So I'm trying to get out of the habit of saying extra things out loud. Uh, let's oh, see. I speak to things all the time. Yeah. Like, I, I... <laughs> I mean, arguably, I do have a lot of conversations when I'm alone in a room with a green screen, but there is, like, a streaming audience for that, so. There's the green yeah. screen right behind you, so. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Always uh... <laughs> watching. We should do the most important question of all. And that is, what could, well, it's not even a question actually. It's a, could you write haiku for our, our time in the cozy corner? Yeah, I usually write them down before I say them. Oh, okay. But like, I mean, I could, I could try to like. I'm pulling out the notes app on my phone here. It's like, okay, here we go. Okay, let's hear it. Red lamp circle shines. Walls splay without perspective. A well-rounded light. Yeah, there we go. That's 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 the motto. <laughs> Put that on the wall. <laughs> there you go. So uh, I think we'll call it here. So how about you tell the lovely people at home where they can find you? What sort of socials sure. you're on and all that? Uh, yeah, well, if anybody's in the Tennessee area, I'll be at Tennessee Game Days down at the Franklin Cool Springs Marriott, March 1st through 3rd. I will also be, if you're in the Alabama area, I'll be in Columbiana, Alabama for Play on Con this July. The precise dates haven't been announced, but I'll be hosting the table flipping and the Minecraft build contests there. You can find me at youtube.com uh, slash joehillstsd. That's short for Team Snow Day, the group that I wrote the Pitfalls and Penguins book with. Oh. I'm on twitch.tv at twitch.tv slash joehills. But if you want to watch my live stream without an intermediary service, you can just go to joehills.net slash live. And anytime I'm live, I've got a uh, self-hosted copy of the stream in high resolution with no ads. So That's cool. You know, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like to have fallback services because I've been doing this... I've been streaming since before Twitch existed, and I'm going to be streaming after Twitch exists. I'm not yes. going to depend on them for my video no. delivery system. I'll let them mirror it for now. Yeah, <laughs> they, 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 they can borrow it for a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, so I stream on YouTube and Twitch, as well as my own website. I've got a uh, Discord chat, as well as those two chats going at all times. Um, you can join my Patreon Discord via patreon.com slash joehills. Well, there you go. I'll uh, leave all those links in the description, or at least most of them. And is there anything you would like to say before we end? Like any advice for people who are watching or... Just... Keep adventuring. Keep adventuring. Perfect. There you go. <laughs>
So, I hope you all enjoyed. If you want to go watch a, another Cozy Corner, I have done a interview with Beef. I'll have a link to that in the description as well. And I will see you next time. Bye!